Uh, welcome again to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Good afternoon. Um, and uh, as is often the case, as is always the case in our forum, we have some really exciting uh, data and progress in science and clinical care to share with you. Um, in this, the theme uh, for today, which is a really interesting one and, and different because we have multiple speakers, is in hematology, where um, we've made, I think, enormous progress uh, and where both biology, uh, translational work, uh, population science, and clinical care in the major hematologic malignancies, leukemia and myeloid dis uh, malignancies, lymphoma, multimyeloma, where I think we have really talented people working on these problems and really translating science into progress for our patients. And um, looking forward to all four presentations, but I, I will actually turn to our, our essentially our, our leader and host for the session to make the introductions. So I'll start simply by introducing Dr. Stephanie Helene. As you know, Stephanie is uh, the chief of hematology at Yale, as well as an associate professor of medicine. In addition, Stephanie oversees the uh, DeLuca Center for Innovation in Hematology Research, uh, which is really an exciting addition to uh, our work in hematology with the promise that not only translating our discoveries into clinical care innovation, but also in furthering the, uh, the support of our faculty and trainees. Uh, Stephanie joined the faculty in Yale in 2006, and we were so pleased that she was selected as our new chief in 2020 and is doing a, a great job and um, looking forward to her and our faculty sharing the exciting work uh, at Yale. So Stephanie, I turn to you. Thank you, Charlie. Let me share my slides. Um, okay, can you see the slides well? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, as Charlie said, today we'll pre I present or will present on translational science and hematology. And there will be four of us, so I will be the one driving the slides. So any hiccups, blame me. Um, so I'll be I'll be giving a brief introduction to hematology, and then Thomas Prebe will um, present on behalf of the myeloid malignancies team. And uh, Thomas is an associate professor of um, medicine and hematology, and um, he's a director of the myeloid malignancies disease team, and the firm chief of the Duffy firm. And everybody knows just how much moving and, and changes had to happen over the past years to keep our clinical um, services alive. And um, Tuma actually completed his doctorate in medical hematology oncology in Lyon, then joined the um, Pauli Calmet Institute in Marseille, um, did a um, Fulbright um, scholarship at Johns Hopkins University. And I think that's how eventually he landed with us um, with Steve Gore recruiting him. After um, Tuma, um, Dr. Francine Fox, um, Professor of Medicine and Hematology and Dermatology will present on behalf of the lymphoma team. And um, Francine really is the expert in um, T-cell lymphoma, internationally, nationally renowned. And she's the research director of the lymphoma disease team and obviously the director of the T-cell lymphoma program. And you will hear exciting um, news of what is happening in lymphoma and T-cell lymphoma. And last but not least, um, Dr. Natalia Neferitza will present on behalf of the multiple myeloma disease team. And she's the research director of the multiple myeloma disease team and an assistant professor in um, medicine, um, medical oncology. She actually obtained her medical degree in Tbilisi in the uh, country of Georgia, um, then uh, did postdoctoral fellowships at Emory Northwestern and lucky for us at Yale. She did her residency and fellowship at Yale briefly left, left us, but we were able to recruit her back to be part of the team. So um, before I introduce much about hematology, I think it's absolutely time that we all say thank you to Charlie. So Charlie, you took over as our interim section chief in January 2018 and has been a just wonderful, wonderful um, journey since then. So you can see just how big the group is in hematology and growing. And I just wanna read a few of the quotes from our faculty. And um, that is, so Charlie, you recognize the strength, resilience and enthusiasm in the hematology faculty, staff, advanced practice providers, nurses and trainees, and you supported our teams in so many ways. 
Thank you for the leadership and commitment you provided as interim team chief. Your strong support and advocacy for our section is much appreciated. Thank you for being an outstanding leader and role model for trainees through your dedication to excellence in patient care, teaching, and innovation. It has been an honor to learn from you and the excellent faculty of Yale Cancer Center. And thank you for everything you've done for the Cancer Center and for the section of hematology over the past several years. You have been a wonderful resource and a guide for my academic growth, and I'm extremely grateful to you. So thank you, Charlie. Well, um, Stephanie, thank you <laughs> and the entire division. It's uh, a real point of pride to me to have been a member uh, and now an alum of this very august uh, center of excellence. So thank you. And um, we have a little bit more in store. So um, the thing we really wanted to thank you for is how you have supported all our people and recruitment of all these people highlighted in yellow. You know, um, Rory Shal is to my like Melinda's team. Um, Shailen Kustari and Tershin Sethi to the lymphoma team. Um, Bob Bona as our director of classical hematology. Sabrina Browning as a member of our myeloma and gammopathy team. And as you can see also of our benign heme team. And then in addition to that, you've recruited hematology focused faculty to the, to the um, Smilo network and the care centers. And we're so fortunate to work with all our colleagues. And of course, Marcus Mission as a director of the Center for Molecular and Cellular. I always say hematology and oncology in there. We're so excited about um, you know, all our new people and teams and what we can achieve together. So, um, so now in, in my introduction to um, hematology. So what you see here is kind of our, these are our hematology core teams. I say core because these are the people located in, in New Haven, North Haven. And um, these are the teams that are working hard to bring the best patient care to all patients in um, Connecticut and beyond through their research, their clinical care, and in collaboration with all the teams we have, Smilo, Yale Haven Health, and um, Yale University. So we have five teams, the myeloid malignancies team, the lymphoma team, the stem cell transplant and cell therapies team. We call it classical hematology because as we all know, benign heme disorders are not that benign. Our patients are quite ill. And then our multiple myeloma and gammopathies team. So um, as I mentioned before, we're not alone. We're not just a small, tiny little point on the map in New Haven, but through our smaller network, we have a reach um, across the entire um, state. And it is just wonderful to know that we can bring the excellent science and treatment to all patients in Connecticut. And again, here I'm highlighting our hematology focused faculty, which is also new over the last several years. And it's just wonderful um, how much team building we can do. There are many discussions already going on between our disease team leaders and faculty in Trumbull, in North Haven, Guilford, Hartford, and all the other places. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, we're not alone and we're not doing this in isolation. So we're fortunate to be at a place um, like Yale where there are many different centers. You know, we have right, Decker Joostar leading the clinical trials office. Again, Marcus leading the CMCO. Marcus Bosenberg leading the Yale um, Center for Immune Oncology. Mark Lemon leading the Yale Cancer Biology Institute. Uh, Carla Neugebauer leading the Yale RNA Center. And then Diane Krause in the YCH. Um, and then chairs of the different departments, uh, um, Chen Liu for pathology, David Chats now Department of Immuno Immunobiology. We have collaborators in the Stem Cell Center. We have collaborators in the Copper Center. Marcella Nunes Smith just gave a talk to, um, to the DART leaders this morning and Antonio Hiraldes and many, many more that I can't even get on this slide. So um, I, just wanted to give a brief update on the DeLuca Center for Innovation and Hematology Research, another um, amazing initiative that Charlie made happen. And um, we are now, we have just writing our progress report for um, the past two years. And just to give you an update, so we have a very active hematology tissue bank uh, with samples from patients with all hematologic disorders. We have over 4,000 samples from over 2,000 patients. We have uh, bone marrows, preferred blood, we're working hard on also collecting lymph node tissue and other tissue biopsies. And uh, we also offer specialized processing for clinical trials in hematology. 
And this is again a huge team effort. So you see our core people on the right, Amisha Patel, Rana Spili, Padma Mamila Pali, and our latest recruit, Jennifer van Udenhoven. But everybody in hematology is contributing to this. All our APPs on MP7 in North Haven, um, at Trumbull and other care centers. And we hope to leverage this tissue bank to better understand diseases and offer new treatments. We have awarded nine pilot grants of $50,000 each. Um, our goal is to have these, being, to these be collaborative between clinicians and basic scientists. We have one career development awardee, um, Shannon Kothari. These are two-year awards and the RFA is posted for new um, applicants. We have many, many application, uh, publications that I could not list here. We have installed a FreezerWorks biorepository database and we're very close to populating it with data that eventually will allow clinicians, scientists in a de-identified manner screen what we have in the database so they can come up with ideas and let us know how we can help them. We're providing access to novel technologies. Jennifer Amisha just performed single cell DNA sequencing for clinical trial samples for Tomacro B and we have many more ideas. And we're also seeking to provide technical support for correlative studies and data analysis. So um, let me now go over to the disease teams. So this, these are the members of the stem cell transplantation cellular therapies team, um, but they will not present today because you should stay tuned and uh, log in to the Yale Cancer Center Grand Rounds. I think it's March 23rd when Dr. Sufi and Dr. Herbert will present on cellular therapies. You will also not hear today from our classical hematology team because um, Dr. Bonard just presented not so long ago in Grand Rounds, but we're also very hopeful to um, getting a slot in the summer when we will have hopefully exciting new recruits to add to the team and we can take a full Grand Rounds for our classical hematology. So the team you will be hearing from today, the first one is our myeloid malignancies team and um, Dr. Prebe will present on behalf of this group. And so now I'm handing over to Dr. Prebe for the first presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephanie, for this uh, really kind introduction. Uh, we've been blessed to have already uh, uh, Nikolai and myself presenting a few, uh, a few weeks ago on this uh, ground round. Uh, and I guess that you know probably most of the uh, members of the team already, uh, Dr. Amar Zaid and Dr. Nikola Podotsev, uh, our newest recruit, uh, Rory Shadis, uh, Dr. Borukov from St. Francis and Dr. Witt uh, from uh, Trumbull. Uh, the collaboration is uh, basically something that uh, is extremely important for us. Um, and uh, on the uh, translational uh, lab side, uh, Stephanie for sure, that has been instrumental in the, in the group as well as uh, Manoj. Uh, uh, Pili. Um, next slide, uh, please. So, uh, as you may know, in myeloid malignancies over the last uh, basically 10 years, we had a real paradigm shift uh, thanks to the uh, revolution of our understanding of the uh, genomics of the disease. Um, that's been true uh, in acute uh, myeloid leukemias. Oh, that's a bit fast. <laughs> Uh, uh, through in the acute uh, myeloid uh, uh, leukemia and in myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, but is basically uh, representative of what we have seen also in our uh, knowledge of myeloproliferative disorders uh, or uh, uh, bone marrow failures, uh, for example. And this uh, revolution in our understanding of uh, the disease uh, translated uh, more recently, and we can switch slide. Uh, in uh, a padding shift also in the management of these diseases. And since 2017, uh, we had more approval than uh, over the last uh, uh, 20, uh, 25 years. Uh, that goes with basically drug at our uh, agnostic of any uh, potential uh, uh, genomic abnormalities such as the uh, CPX351, for example, or uh, more recently the venetoclax, but also drug uh, that are no standard of care for uh, basically um, uh, mutated diseases such as FAT3 mutated AML or uh, potentially uh, IDH uh, mutated uh, diseases. Uh, 
Uh, interestingly, this revolution that started with the uh, acute myeloleukemia, uh, we're starting to see uh, things picking up also uh, in uh, myeloproliferative disorders with the recent uh, approval of fedratinib, as well as uh, with uh, myelodysplastic syndrome with uh, recently the uh, approval of the TGF beta inhibitor, the Spatercept, as well as the uh, oral decytabine. Um, so, um, all of that is extremely important and um, allow us to uh, basically uh, uh, have a real uh, improvement for our uh, patient uh, regarding prognostics, regarding option of treatment. But we're still in a situation where uh, acute myeloid leukemias and myelodysplastic syndromes are hard to treat disease. Um, if you uh, standardize the, the incidence rate of acute myeloid leukemia, that's still in the top five of the most deadliest uh, cancer that we have to face uh, in the US. And uh, one of the goals that we had uh, in the group has been to really uh, work on different aspects to try to uh, uh, improve the result of uh, the different treatment. And we can switch to the next slide. Um, and we really tried to, to work from single cell to population research and population outcome um, and that's just not uh, uh, basically to to to, uh, to 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 basically uh, have a stun, but that's really what is the uh, myeloid uh, malignancy group uh, going from as uh, Stephanie was mentioning uh, our first result in uh, single cell sequencing uh, in acute uh, myeloid uh, leukemias. Uh, the research that Stephanie and Manoj are leading in the lab around. Uh, um, uh, mouse model of uh, acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndromes, RNA uh, for Manoj, uh, to uh, the collaboration that we have with the COBA group um, led by Amr, uh, Nikolai, and Rory on outcome uh, research. Uh, from a pure uh, clinical research standpoint, our uh, group has been uh, instrumental in uh, several key um, studies uh, um, uh, that led to approval of these drugs over the last few years. Uh, but our portfolio and our goal is really focused on early development of a new agent. Uh, right now, our clinical portfolio is roughly 40% of phase one trials um, with uh, basically a good number six uh, out of 19 active trials that are uh, investigator-initiated uh, uh, trial. Uh, and thanks to uh, all of the commitment of the research staff, thanks to all of the commitment of the different members of the group, uh, we're right now at uh, a rate of index cases included in clinical trials on main campus that is 15 to 20 percent. Uh, which is uh, uh, pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, we definitely aim to uh, uh, do uh, better, and we definitely uh, aim to be able to export the research we're doing from the main campus to different sites of the network and be able to have better access uh, for our uh, uh, patient uh, in the network. Uh, as mentioned by Stephanie, uh, we have a pretty uh, efficient and pretty large uh, clinically annotated biobank. And I think we can give kudos to Stephanie uh, to initiate the esports in 2011. So we're a decade in uh, right now. We, we should definitely uh, uh, celebrate about that. And that gives us a, a lot of leverage potentially uh, to be able to develop some trans translational uh, research. Uh, as well as potentially uh, bringing some collaboration uh, uh, from the uh, outside with pharmaceutical companies as well as from academic uh, centers. We can go to the next uh, next slide. Uh, just wanted to highlight uh, basically uh, uh, two programs, more than two uh, studies, two programs basically going on. The first one uh, are the, the efforts led by um, Amr Zaidan on uh, immunologic approaches in myeloid malignancies and uh, probably Amal does not remember, but I vividly remember our first discussion years ago when we were in Hopkins together around potentially how this uh, new immunotherapies can be uh, instrumental in uh, our uh, disease, uh, uh, disease uh, type, basically. Uh, 
what has been done is uh, basically around the, the addition of uh, uh, the first generation, but also right now the second generation of immuno-oncology agents to uh, conven conventional therapy. Uh, we are right now activating a, 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 a very broad uh, induction chemotherapy plus uh, nivolumab uh, study uh, under the uh, umbrella of uh, uh, CTEP. Uh, with the first patient that we hope to include uh, in the next uh, uh, few weeks. Uh, we just have finished the uh, uh, accrual on the uh, uh, pembrolizumab uh, plus uh, antinostat uh, MDS trial for the group of patients with uh, uh, myelodysplastic agent, uh, myelodysplastic uh, uh, syndrome failed by a eating agent. And uh, we are looking forward for this data that has been uh, basically uh, uh, possible to, uh, uh, to develop thanks to collaboration uh, with Yale Science. Uh, that's work uh, with initially uh, TK uh, came when it was still uh, here. And we have also uh, a chronic myeloleukemia studies uh, 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 sponsored by ECOG on the addition of PEMBRO uh, on uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, for a patient with chronic myeloid leukemias and active uh, residual uh, disease. Uh, besides this uh, uh, trial, uh, we also have been implicated basically uh, thanks to AMR leadership on uh, some of the development of the newest generation of uh, um, uh, immuno-oncology agents such as the TIN3 uh, inhibitor. Uh, and uh, we hope to have uh, more results to, uh, to show on that in the uh, near uh, future. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, so the, the IDHML MDS program, that's something that I already uh, presented basically uh, a few weeks ago during the, the ground rounds, but um, I, I definitely uh, like this program as it's really a homegrown program thanks to uh, the work and interaction with uh, Stephanie and Ranjit. So that's really a, a good example of what we can achieve at, uh, at Yale uh, working together. Uh, we have been able to, to show how we can exploit the, the weaknesses of uh, IDH uh, mutated AML and MDS. Uh, as you can see, uh, when uh, we have an IDH mutation and uh, the presence of 2HG in the milieu, um, that creates some brackenous phenotype that can be potentially uh, uh, targeted by using PARP uh, inhibitor on the upper right side. You can see that treatment with Olaparib in uh, our primary uh, uh, samples engrafted in mice can potentially significantly uh, reduce the disease burden uh, in uh, mice engrafted with uh, acute myeloid leukemia presenting um, an IDH uh, uh, mutation, including in some samples where we already have uh, documented a resistance to uh, IDH uh, inhibitors uh, in the uh, uh, clinic. And that led to the uh, CTAP trial currently ongoing um, with uh, right now six patients uh, included, uh, including uh, four at, uh, at Yale, uh, with basically the uh, use of Olaparib, uh, the PARP inhibitor, for AML and uh, MDS patient uh, uh, with IDH mutation. Interestingly, uh, through the discussion with TTEP, we've been able to have uh, uh, a patient that were not yet exposed uh, to uh, IDH inhibitor potentially um, integrating the uh, trial with an early evaluation uh, that would allow potentially to uh, uh, switch to IDH inhibitor. There was no some uh, clear cut uh, benefit after a few weeks on uh, uh, treatment. So that's two of the main program that we have right now. I'm not gonna basically talk too much about the, uh, the outcome research as we, we add with uh, basically uh, Nikolai, good review of uh, what uh, was going on uh, um, on this group a few a few weeks ago. Uh, but as we were discussing, we really want to uh, be able to, to bridge the uh, most uh, basic science aspect uh, of it, what we're doing in the in the labs, to this outcome uh, research. Go go ahead. We still have a lot of clinical and results, uh, clinical issues, and that's the topic. We're not addressing all of them, but some of them are definitely uh, on the focus of the group. Uh, the management of higher risk disease in AML and MDS, uh, complex karyotype, 
uh, uh, NLL uh, mutated or a rearranged disease are uh, one of the focus of development of the group. And I, especially uh, Rory uh, is developing some different concepts around uh, these lines. Uh, the optimization of targeted therapies and immunotherapies, we talked about that. Um, one of the challenges basically that we are still working with a disease that is not as common as uh, breast or colon cancer, and we uh, end up with more combination uh, and sequence of agent uh, than uh, patient. And that's potentially where the uh, uh, interaction with the lab and the work that we're doing with Stephanie is extreme and Manoj are extremely uh, uh, important. Um, the targeting of leukemia stem cell, leukemia initiating cells, and the management of me measurable residual disease at the molecular level is obviously something that is uh, uh, on our mind. And that's a lot of interaction also with our transplant group and cell therapy group on how potentially to, to, to uh, work um, around this uh, concept. And last but not least, uh, before getting to the point where we have um, active disease, working on predisposition and potentially clonal hematopoiesis is something that is extremely um, interesting right now with some collaboration we will have uh, with the uh, uh, cardiology group and the uh, generation uh, project. Um, I think I have one last uh, slide. So we feel that we, uh, we are pretty blessed in the group to have already a pretty solid uh, foundation, but we want to do uh, better, and that's going to be by leveraging the, uh, the excellence uh, that we have at Yale, uh, the molecular biology aspect, uh, with basically right now uh, some development in uh, single cell sequencing uh, using multi omics uh, approaches that can potentially be used in myeloid, but not only in myeloid uh, malignancies. Uh, potential collaboration and avenues of collaboration with the uh, Yale Center of Immuno uh, Oncology. Uh, um, and with a group of Marcus Munchen also to potentially uh, work on uh, resistance disease, immuno-oncology in myeloid malignancies, and uh, the really fruitful and really uh, uh, exciting collaboration we have with the copper group, uh, Kerry Gross, uh, Shalmay uh, Ma, um, with a lot of publication and um, a lot more uh, that will come in the next months and year. Uh, we want to expand our collaboration. Uh, that's going to be more collaboration on the basic science group. Um, partners like Jun Lu or Shang Quin uh, Go are uh, definitely uh, people that will uh, be more and more uh, on the stage with us uh, and more product will come with us, uh, as well as more collaboration on the clinical research side, obviously with the BMT and cell therapy group, but also with the pediatric DART for the adolescent and young adults. And I think that's all I have. Thank you so much, Tamara. This is really awesome. So we'll go straight into our next presentation by Dr. Foss on behalf of the Myeloid Malignancies team. Hi, um, this is Francine, and I'd like to thank Stephanie and also uh, Charlie for all of your work to bring us to where we are today with uh, this faculty and the development that, we, that we've had in the lymphoma program. So uh, lymphoma program consists of myself, uh, Scott Huntington, Iris Sufi. Shalin Kothari, uh, Tarshin Sethi, um, and Francesca Montanari, both of whom have recently joined us. Francesca is in Greenwich. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, this is the landscape of lymphoma. So lymphoma really um, is many different diseases and that's a challenge for us um, as a group with limited resources um, in terms of trying to figure out how we focus this clinical trial effort. So it turns out that uh, out of the 21,000 cases of cancer in Connecticut per year, there are about 900 plus or minus cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's really um, our denominator population. Um, and our efforts are to try to get many of these patients onto clinical trials. If you look at the curve at the bottom, you can see the frequency of the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, uh, the low-grade marginal um, zone lymphomas, uh, being the most common subtypes, and T cell lymphoma and mantle, and mantle cell lymphoma and Burkitt's are, you can see, are rare compared to these other common subtypes. Next slide. Um, so the unresolved clinical issues, of course, are um, how we make sense of 90 different uh, subtypes of lymphoma um, and divide those into general themes for clinical trials. I'll talk a little bit about that. 
in a minute. Um, but you know, we do have uh, diseases where the modern regimes pretty much are okay in terms of producing favorable outcomes for these patients. Um, but there are within these um, more favorable um, subgroups of patients, those patients with high risk molecular features that um, continue to fail conventional therapy uh, and would be subjects for novel clinical trials. And those include double hit um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, and one of the things that we've done with that disease is to combine dose-adjusted EPOC with lenalidomide. In addition, we have um, some patients with low-risk lymphoma where we could actually test de-escalation of therapy. Uh, and a good example of that is classical Hodgkin's disease. And I'm gonna show you um, another example for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, we also have histologies where the modern regimens are in, in, ineffective, pretty much um, inadequate uh, for these aggressive patients, such as the T-cell lymphomas, the P53 mutant mantle cell lymphomas, and the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. So in these cases, we're uh, trying to incorporate novel agents into the front line, but also trying to figure out how to incorporate allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, and the newer CAR T cell therapies. We'd love to use molecular and genetic profiling in these diseases to select patients rationally for pathway-directed clinical trials. Um, and those efforts are now underway thanks to the work of Stephanie uh, to get our um, tissue bank up and running. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, okay, next slide. Um, so um, just touching on um, how we're de-escalating therapy, this is a really great example of a trial that Scott has opened for relapsed aggressive B-cell lymphomas, uh, where we have a non-chemotherapy approach. So basically this uh, study involves oral agents, a BTK inhibitor, an mTOR inhibitor, and an IMIT. Um, and it turns out that when you combine these three oral therapies, this is a very effective strategy for patients with aggressive lymphoma who have failed conventional chemotherapy. Some of them have failed transplant as well. On the next slide, Stephanie, um, you can see an example of one of our patients. Um, it turns out that Yale actually has enrolled the majority of patients, the 21 patients to date in this trial, and responses have been observed among a different subtype of patients you can see with DLBCL, with low-grade lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, et cetera. Um, and patients with very dramatic responses with large masses and extensive disease. So we're really excited about this approach. Um, and again, we'd all like to start thinking more about uh, oral rather than IV therapies for patients that are gonna be chronically needing therapy, such as many of our lymphoma patients, unfortunately. Next slide would uh, highlight um, another approach, which is to take an active drug, look at its resistance mechanisms and come up with um, uh, similar drugs that might be active in resistant mutational settings. Uh, in this case, uh, BTK inhibitors are one of our most active newer agents in B-cell lymphoma, but most of the failures uh, to these agents are related to the development of specific mutations. Um, and now we have these new non-covalent BTK inhibitors that actually uh, are able to subvert those mutations uh, and induce responses in patients. Uh, and this is an agent uh, that we're working with now, LOXO305, uh, that falls into that category that's highly active. Uh, we're currently um, embarking upon a number of phase two studies that we hope to make available broadly across our care centers, uh, looking at a number of different B-cell lymphomas with these novel agents. Next slide. Um, uh, this is some interesting work um, and translational research done by Shalin Kothari in our group. So Shalin is looking at uh, ways of dealing with uh, development of resistance to active agents such as venetoclax. Uh, and uh, here are a set of experiments where he has shown that proteasome inhibition is synergistic with venetoclax um, in patients with B-cell lymphoma and in these clinical models. So you can see um, the bortezomib, carbizumib, and exasimib by themselves, which are proteasome inhibitors, have some activity to induce apoptosis, as does venetoclax. But when you combine these agents, you can see synergistic activity. Uh, and based on uh, this in vitro work that Shalin has done, he's embarking on a CTEP-sponsored phase one, two clinical trial where he's combining venetoclax with these proteasome inhibitors. Uh, and we're very excited for Shalin uh, to get that trial up and running. Um, on the next slide, um, you can see uh, the correlative science that he's developed around this uh, clinical trial. 
including a single cell dissociation to look at the specific BCL2 family members um, by aqua, um, as well as by mass spec. He's also doing uh, exome sequencing, RNA-seq, um, and trying to um, obtain tissues from these patients for later PDX development. So that's all very exciting, and we're really proud of Shalin for that. Uh, in addition, uh, he's, he's doing what other groups are doing um, to embark on uh, looking for a circulating tumor DNA in these patients, and um, hopefully some of us will be able to incorporate that into our uh, disease group uh, studies as well. Next uh, slide. So, um, and then the last thing I wanna mention is exciting work that uh, Shalin is doing with the CATS lab to use a different approach called PROTAC to target anti-apoptotic proteins potentially for therapeutic benefit. So PROTAC uh, basically is a heterobifunctional small molecule that consists of a linker and two warheads, one of them binding to the target pro protein, such as uh, the BCL2 and the other recruiting uh, the E3 ligase to basically lead to the degradation of that protein. So we're looking forward to uh, this work coming to fruition in the clinic in the future. Next slide, um, just highlights uh, some of the work that uh, Scott has done uh, working with the Copper Group to look at, uh, at outcomes um, in patients with lymphoma. Um, and so Scott has uh, done a number of studies, including these two, uh, one of which uh, shows that um, uh, patients uh, with, uh, who are older than um, 80 um, have a higher frequency of discontinuing active therapies like abrutinib within the first 180 days. Uh, so obviously one has to go back and look at why that is and uh, ways that we can um, alter that therapy so those patients can continue to be treated. And then also Scott has done a lot of work with cost effectiveness, and this is just one of his um, studies looking at uh, different treatments for CLL getting a brutinib up front versus uh, getting it later on. So again, uh, Scott has presented some of this work at the national meetings and um, there are a number of studies ongoing with copper. Next slide will then segue us into T-cell lymphomas. Um, T-cell lymphomas overall um, are heterogeneous as are B-cell lymphomas and tend not to do as well with conventional therapies as you can see in this outcomes curve. Uh, Progression-free survival um, and median survival is poor for many of these aggressive T-cell subtypes. The next slide um, highlights one of the things that we've been trying to do. So patients um, with T-cell lymphoma get CHOP-based chemotherapy up front, and only a small percentage of them um, actually are cured with this approach. Uh, patients would go on to an autologous stem cell transplant if they have a complete remission. But it turns out that uh, when you look at registry studies, one of which we conducted here, only about 25% of patients up front ever make a transplant. The reason being that many of those patients don't have a good remission. And so this is a study that I worked on with Tarshin, and uh, this study is hopefully um, going to get started very soon, where we combined mogamolizumab with upfront chemotherapy, in this case, EPOC, for patients with aggressive T-cell lymphoma. The idea being that uh, mogamolizumab um, is a CCR4 monoclonal antibody that targets both tumor cells, at, but also more importantly, Tregs in the microenvironment. And so we're hoping that there's going to uh, be an interaction uh, both in the microenvironment as well as potential synergy with the tumor cells when this is combined with chemotherapy. Um, I don't have a slide to show you this, but Tarshin has also developed some very nice correlative studies to go along with this. The next slide um, will take you into the world of relapsed T-cell lymphoma. Uh, and just to demonstrate to you uh, the work of our group, to look at a number of different agents targeting a number of different pathways that are relevant. Um, and some of these studies, uh, Yale has been the top one or, or two um, in terms of accrual for these studies nationwide. Uh, and these are novel agents, uh, and I'll touch on a couple of them in the next slide or two. Um, Go back, uh, and this is, um, this is um, next slide. Okay, this is Tipifarnib, which um, is a uh, Farnesyl transferase inhibitor, but it turns out that, that it also down regulates CXCL12, uh, which is in the microenvironment. Um, patients who have expression of CXCL12 in the microenvironment don't do as well, as you can see on this um, survival curve. And we've had some incredibly dramatic responses using this single oral agent and some of our patients, such as this gentleman who has failed multiple therapies and autologous transplanted, this has really salvaged 
uh, a lot of people. Uh, we're hoping to initiate some IITs with this molecule um, in the next couple of months. Next slide shows you um, another approach with microRNA. So this is the first in man study of this microRNA, which targets a number of different types of lymphoma. We put a number of patients with cutaneous lymphoma on this trial, and you can see uh, responses in pretty much all of the patients that were treated uh, based on these waterfall plots. Um, and then the next slide, I think, is really um, one of the most important um, findings with this microRNA, which is its activity in HTLV-1-associated adult T-cell leukemia. Uh, and again, we put the majority of patients um, in this cohort on this trial. Um, and we also initiated the correlative studies that you see below, showing that the uh, molecule directly inhibits the proliferation of ATL cells, modulates the expression of various activation markers, um, and you can see the, uh, the changes um, in proliferation index with this molecule. And th this is um, all samples from our patients that were drawn at different time points. So uh, we're very excited to get this data published. Uh, next slide. Um, just a couple of other studies initiated. Um, this is uh, another of Tarshin's study looking at incorporation of pembrolizumab with an active agent, brentuximab vidotin in CD30 positive T cell lymphomas. And again, this is, um, this is her IIT. Uh, and there are some correlative studies associated with this. Um, and the next slide. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the next slide uh, will segue into um, some of the efforts uh, that Francesca has looking um, at, in a couple of different areas um, in the context of aggressive lymphomas. This is her. Um, Global T cell consortium study, which she conducted um, at Columbia and is now brought to Yale. Um, and this is now a randomized phase two study where she's looking at five or, uh, oral azacytidine and romadepsin compared to investigators' choice. This is a multi center study, uh, and we're really, really excited that Francesca has brought this to us. Um, and the next slide um, is another effort in an area that we have not explored, which is uh, PTLD, so post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, in this study, um, Francesca is um, using sequential treatment um, for patients that are CD20 and CD30 positive, and you can see the schema uh, for this trial here. Uh, this is also an IIT that's being um, conducted in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic and UVA. So I think we have um, some really nice work from some of our younger investigators, and we're very excited about that. Uh, the next slide um, is just um, our summary slide, um, looking at what our future is and where we're uh, hoping to go in the lymphoid malignancies. So clearly we will benefit from the annotated database that you've heard about, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be contributing uh, our samples in an ongoing fashion to the biobank. We also need to develop a sequencing uh, platform, which we really don't have here at the Institution for Lymphoma, uh, we're currently sending our samples out, but we certainly would like to do that um, in the near future. Um, I talked about the biobank and how important that is, uh, but also we're now starting to talk about thematic direction for the program. And one of the areas that we're focusing on, at least in T-cell lymphoma, as you've seen, uh, is on the microenvironment and immuno immunomodulatory strategies that can be used um, with correlative uh, science in these T-cell lymphoma studies. And then finally, I, I just want to acknowledge um, the translational science collaborators, and this by no means is um, an exhaustive list of folks, but there have been a number of studies that have been funded um, by both DeLuca as well as um, other um, uh, mechanisms for funding. Um, and those include studies done with the CATS lab, uh, with Marcus's lab, which is now being engaged um, with these studies, the Lolas lab in pharmacology, um, and even the imaging labs um, within nuclear medicine with Dr. Kai. Um, and others that I didn't mention as well. So I think um, we have a very bright future ahead of us in the lymphoid malignancies. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for, I've jumped. Thank you, Francine. That is absolutely tour, tour de force and lymphoma and so excited about everything that is to come and very excited about our next presentation by Dr. Natalia Neferitza on multiple myeloma and gammopathies. Stephanie, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to let me present today. And I would like to echo some of your comments and thank, thank Charlie for his outstanding leadership at the Cancer Center. So today I'm happy to present on behalf of my Loma team uh, with brief clinical and research updates. Here's our team, myself, Terry Parker, Nofar Barr, and Sabrina Browning, as well as Elon Gorshin at Guilford. Um, next slide, please. 
I'll start with brief background about the disease. As, as you all know, multiple myeloma is the um, clonal plasma cell neoplasma originating in the bone marrow. The diagnosis rests on the bone marrow biopsy and some of the key immunohistochemical stains and protein studies on the blood and the urine. The etiopathogenesis of this disorder remains largely obscure. We know of certain associations such as um, perhaps antigenic stimulation, role of uh, pathogenic microbes, lipid antigens, um, and other associations such as metabolic syndromes, diabetes, and such. But in large majority of patients, we don't know the cause, and uh, much remains to be elucidated in, in this research. Next slide, please. So um, as you know, the disease is continuum, and we know that myeloma, every case is pre, uh, preceded by the precursor state called MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And after years of its presence, it progresses to the early phase myeloma, commonly referred to as smoldering or asymptomatic myeloma. But a full-blown clinical disease which requires um, active therapy is the disease that, which leads to end organ damage in the form of high calcium, renal failure, anemia, and bone lesions. And in the old days, we would resort to plain x-rays. However, this has been largely uh, replaced by advanced imaging modalities, such as whole body MRI or whole body PET CT scans. Next, please. So my, once diagnosed, the treatment uh, pattern of multiple myeloma consists of initial induction therapy with usual three drug, or in 2021, you might use a four drug regimen incorporating some of the monoclonal antibodies up front, such as daratumumab. In appropriate patients, this is then followed by high-dose melphalon and autologous stem cell rescue, um, aka autotransplant. And then so this is sub subsequently followed by maintenance therapy, which is usually long-term and um, until progression of disease. So the treatment pattern resembles a marathon rather than the sprint as we continue maintenance uh, for many years for these patients who remain in remission. Next. Um, and invariably, sooner or later, every patient experiences a relapse, and this is due to uh, branching uh, pattern of clonal evolution or pers persistence of pre previous clones. And uh, at the time of relapse, patients have to sequence through the available therapies, each of which then leads to shorter and shorter overall duration of response, eventually leading to um, um, dismal prognosis for many of the refractory patients. Next, please. Fortunately, we've had a number of drug approvals over the course of past decade, which includes the novel proteasome inhibitors in the form of carfilzomib, novel immunomodulatory agents, pomalidomide, and others. The biggest breakthroughs came in 2015 when we had several approvals, namely IgG monoclonal antibody targeting CD38 um, receptor on the plasma cell, daratumumab, um, as well as checkpoint inhibitor targeting SLAMF7 or CS1, elotuzumab, orally available proteus inhibitor, exazomib. We also had approval for histone deacetylase inhibitor, panobinostat, which is orally available. And more recently, a, a drugs of completely different mechanism of action, such as uh, Selinexor, uh, received approval by FDA in 2019. This is a selective nuclear export um, inhibitor promoting some of the tumor suppressor gene action. And uh, within the past year, approval of another IgG monoclonal antibody um, against CD38, isatuximab, with slightly different mechanism of action, but very similar to daratumumab. And more recently, just summer of last year, uh, first antibody drug conjugate got FDA approval. Um, this is belantamab mafodotin uh, targeting B cell maturation antigen, which is currently approved for relapse refractory multiple myeloma beyond four prior lines of therapy. Next. So despite these therapeutic advances, number of clinical challenges remain, primarily the concerns about what to do for refractory myeloma. Are we able to, in the novel immunotherapy era, replace the high-dose melphalon by some of the novel strategies, such as CAR T-cell or other therapeutics? Um, how best to continue the maintenance therapy for patients, particularly high-risk cytogenetic subsets? Um, and we're far from understanding the disease biology and choosing the sequential therapy based on biology of disease, and its selection of therapy in many cases is random, and this is a clinical challenge. Um, same is true for AL amyloidosis 
because as you know, about 10% of multiple myeloma patients will develop concurrent soft tissue deposition of the lambda or kappa light chains. And this is an unmet need in all of um, a gammopathy world um, as these patients, the care is not well defined. So it remains to be established what is the optimal first line, second line and beyond therapy for patients with this. Next, please. So while facing these challenging issues in clinic, we try to integrate our clinical expertise and incorporate some of the novel research therapeutic strategies and continue to educate our patients as well as our trainees. Next. Um, in terms of individual focus of clinical expertise, um, Terry Parker has an outstanding clinical expertise in AL amyloidosis, having served as a national PI, a number of a AL amyloidosis trials, as well as for relapse refractory myeloma. Nofar, um, Nofar's focus has been mostly um, on high-dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplant for myeloma as well as cellular therapies in myeloma. Sabrina also has an excellent expertise in AL amyloidosis. Um, she did a separate fellowship in amyloidosis at the Boston Medical Center. She also focuses on understanding the biology of some of the precursor states. And my own uh, clinical research has focused on understanding clonal heterogeneity and incorporating advanced imaging in this disease therapeutic um, assessment. Uh, so education is, of course, an integral component of our daily work. This is a group of current fellows rotating through myeloma clinics during this academic year, and many of them have been involved in uh, research projects in myeloma. So for instance, Wei Xin Liu has been working on myeloma Yale database project and looking at outcomes in patients treated with monoclonal antibodies. Talib Dosani has the bone disease in myeloma cohort and looking to develop quality improvement projects tar targeting this. Um, Eric Chang will be involved in this uh, PROMISE study, which is a, a screening and community outreach project for patients with gammopathies and their families. And it has an important outreach project and we're partnering with Dana, uh, Dana Farber, Dr. Gobriel on this project. And uh, finally, Ross Merkin will be involved in the collaborative effort um, where we may study the antigenic targets of monoclonal antibodies of um, myeloma uh, with the help of immunology lab of uh, Aaron Ring. Next, please. Um, so our research uh, consists of different missions. On one hand, we always try to enhance our clinical trial portfolio. We have ongoing trials, both investigator initiated as well as um, industry and collaborative group trials in every space of this disease, including early stage, smoldering, as well as newly diagnosed and late relapse refractory patients. And we always try to develop additional therapeutic concepts for uh, refractory myeloma and AL amyloidosis. On the other hand, we do have certain outcomes um, research initiatives, and this include both myeloma as well as uh, MGUS database, as well as bone disease and myeloma, collaboration with our copper team. And finally, on the research basic science research front, we've been trying to build teams to collaborate with researchers to study monoclonal antibodies, their driving antigens, and do additional immune profiling to understand predictive biomarkers of disease response and study extramedullary disease. Next, please. So um, on the basic science research front, I think the um, Stephanie Helene's uh, Biobank project for hematology has been really instrumental in our program. At uh, North Haven Myeloma Program, we've, we essentially biobank the bone marrow and peripheral blood on every single patient that we diagnose with multiple myeloma or uh, gammopathy. And we hope uh, to build collaboration and with the help from David Schatz lab to develop ex vivo multiple myeloma mouse models where we can uh, develop uh, robust preclinical models using this. In addition, um, studying uh, monoclonal antibodies and understanding the antigenic targets and what drives the disease in collaboration with Aaron Ring's lab. Um, on clinical research front, we've had active clinical uh, collaboration and a um, couple of IITs uh, closely working with musculoskeletal radiology. And in this, Andy Hames and Andy Lishuk both have been instrumental, um, as well as our pathology colleagues, Mina Zhu and Zheng Gang Pen. Um, Nofar and Sabrina have ongoing collaboration with Anne Heberman from lab laboratory medicine to understand immune profiling 
counseling of patients to understand the biologic response in different subsets of myeloma patients treated with monoclonal antibodies. In terms of outcomes research, um, we've had active collaboration with hematology copper team, with the leadership uh, of Xiamei Ma and Scott Huntington. We have several ongoing projects and one of them, a recent one using Flatiron database and one particular myeloma project examining uh, patterns of care, in, especially in the context of COVID um, period. And lastly, uh, we've been trying to build this disease team, um, which we refer to myeloma bone disease uh, program collaboration under which we try to bring together different departments, including endocrinology, Carl and Sonia, as well as orthopedic and spine center, Dieter Linskog and Louise Kolb. And as I said, Talib Dosani has an ongoing outcomes project looking into bone disease and myeloma. Um, so uh, with that, I will stop. I'm excited to have such great collaborators and colleagues on the campus, and I will leave a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, so I'll unshare my screen. Just so people know we have hematology joined 2021. We have a Twitter handle, so uh, we'll try and use it. So I'm going to unshare so we can see everybody. And um, let me pull up the chat um, to see if there are questions. Are there questions? Would anybody like to raise their hand and ask a question? If not, I can start with one and um, you know, maybe I'll ask Francine, since I'm always a molecular person and I know right, we have this phenomenal um, effort to get um, this goal panel and whole exome sequencing to our patients. Do you think that that will fulfill your need or what do we need to do to improve on that? I think that's certainly a start, you know, as you know, Stephanie, we see some um, of these rare, rare lymphoma patients for whom there's really no treatment algorithm and we're just kind of picking out of a hat to try to figure out what to do. Um, in the era of precision medicine, I really think that we should be profiling these patients and sequencing them and rationally developing strategies. So we would love to be able to start doing that. I think the, the critical component of that, as you know, is being able to get hold of the tissue uh, when it's biopsied and to get it to the right place um, as soon as possible. Uh, we're also very interested in looking at circulating tumor cells uh, and whether that's a strategy that we could, um, we could use as well. Okay, fantastic, exciting. Um... Are there any other questions? I don't see any in the chat. Well, so one of the things, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. No, no, uh, Francine, I guess I would ask, and I think you each allude to it, but where do you think cell therapy is going? And then obviously it's relevant to each of the domains being described. So where do you think five years from now will be with respect to cell therapies? Well, we talk a lot about that with respect to transplant that we were just talking um, at BMT rounds today uh, about whether we'll be doing autologous transplants in the future or not. Um, I, and I think that that's kind of where we're heading. I just want to say that uh, one of the things that Yale is doing, by the way, is we are developing our own CAR-T and we didn't get a chance to talk about that. But um, Dr. Katz and colleagues have developed the RNA CAR strategy um, and we're working on that. I know he has a B-cell construct as well as one for T-cell lymphoma. So I think the whole car world is undergoing evolution as well. And hopefully we're gonna be at the forefront of some of that. Oh, there's a question from the audience. Um, will the, from Dr. Kai, will the new drug substitute of chemotherapy in um, treatment? Also, will the new drug substitute chemotherapy treatment? From Dr. Kai. Um, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that yeah. I think that's a question to everybody. Can we get rid of chemo? <laughs> this toxic stuff. I mean, we, we had a we had a sample where we were able to to do that, like uh, acute polymyositic <sighs> leukemias. I mean, that's that's a poster child. I, I know, uh, but uh, potentially, yes, that can be uh, that can be the one of the goal we have. Um, we should not basically uh, forget that. Uh, chemotherapies have side effects, but uh, targeted therapies have side effects too. And so um, we should not be in a situation where we are 
are really uh, completely uh, disparaging chemo too much, uh, as it has some real, uh, basically, benefits for, uh, for some of the patients. And for chemotherapy as well as for cell therapy, um, I think we need to see the big picture on how we can sequence and combine these different modalities of treatment, uh, rather than playing one against the, uh, against the other. Okay, awesome. So I think we have reached one o'clock or one minute past one o'clock. Um, so Tamar, Francine, Natalia, thank you for the fantastic presentation. Charlie, thank you for hosting us. <laughs> and thank you for everything on behalf of everybody in um, hematology. Well, and thank you to everyone who's attending. Yeah, phenomenal work. I just think about in my tenure what's been going on in hematology, Yale. It's really exciting. So congratulations to all the speakers and all the investigators and staff working on this. All right. Thank you very okay. much.